So I just want to say thank you to you guys and thank you to our speakers for coming to join us tonight. Um, I might not be a familiar face to some of you. Um, my name is Kimberly and I'm the Education Events Associate here at the USDAN Institute um, at the Animal Medical Center. So I'm really excited to have you guys here because we're celebrating One Health Day. Um, and One Health Day is actually a global event. It's celebrated around the world. And that term, One Health, um, according to the One Health Commission, is a collaborative collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach working locally, regionally, nationally, and globally to achieve optimal health and well-being of all animals, people, plants, and our shared environment, and recognizing those connections between them. So this year, um, for our One Health Day, which we've been having for the past several years, we're focusing on genetic testing um, and how advancements in this field are contributing to the decisions that we make about health in our everyday lives. Um, so tonight, we're so pleased to have with us um, four distinguished guests. Um, we have Priyanka um, from Columbia University Medical Center, Dr. Eleanor Carlson from the Broad Institute, Dr. Mark Stokel from Rockefeller University, and our very own Dr. Carly Fox, um, who will be moderating our event tonight. Um, and for our event, we're going to be hearing from each of our panelists on their line of work and the impact of genetic testing in their field. This is going to be followed by a series of panel questions. Um, and then we will open up questions to the audience. So we just ask that you hold your questions to the end um, and just wait until you've been handed the microphone so that our audio and the live stream can pick up your voice and capture your question. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our moderator for the tonight. Um, uh, Dr. Carly Fox. So Dr. Carly Fox obtained her undergraduate degree in animal sciences from Cornell University um, in 2005. She then attended veterinary school at Ross University and Cornell University, graduating in 2009. Carly completed a rotating medicine and surgery internship at the Animal Medical Center in 2010. Following her postdoctorate training, she joined the AMC full-time in the emergency and critical care department, which is where she was hanging out all day today before joining us here for our event. Um, she's proud to work in one of the busiest veterinary emergency rooms in the world for the past nine years and has a special interest in trauma, emergency procedures, and toxicities. And she enjoys training veterinary interns in the ER slash ICU and was awarded AMC's annual Clendenin J. Rye Memorial Teaching Award in 2016. And we're really extremely grateful to have her here tonight, so please give a warm welcome to Dr. Fox. Thank you. Wow, that was a lot of information about me. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Okay, um, thank you guys all so much for coming. I'm really excited to moderate this panel and to get started. Our first speaker is Priyanka, Priyanka Ahimas. Wonderful. She's a senior genetic counselor at Columbia University Medical Center in pediatrics. She's also the lead coordinator of the Congenital Anomalies Research Exploration or CARE. It investigates genomic factors contributing to the formation of various birth defects. Her research interests also include studying the effects of genetic testing on the lives of patients, which is obviously very important. So if everyone can give her a warm welcome. She's going to present first. Thank you for the introduction, and um, let me just pull up my presentation. Okay, great. Um, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Priyanka. I'm a genetic counselor at Columbia University. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here today to really talk to you about genetic testing trends in medicine. Full disclosure, I primarily deal with people, not so much with animals, although I do have two cats at home. Um, but I, I wanted to get a sense of how many people in the audience know who a genetic counselor is or what they do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's, that's a lot more than usual. So I thought I'd start off with just explaining who a genetic counselor is, just taking a quick minute to explain what it is I really do, and then we'll talk a little bit more about genetic testing trends. Um, so in a nutshell, genetic counselors are uh, trained providers who guide and counsel patients on the risks, benefits, and limitations of genetic testing. And we also help interpret and explain the genetic testing results to patients in the context of their medical um, and family histories. Um, I, I, there are about 5,000 genetic counselors right now in the country, so it's a little bit of a niche field, um, but we primarily work in 
um, reproductive medicine, pediatrics, uh, cardiology, and, and neurology, um, as well as oncology is a huge field. Um, I myself work primarily in the cardiovascular clinic at Columbia Hospital. Um, so most of the patients I interact with are individuals who either have or are at risk of inheriting um, a hereditary cardiac condition. Um, and as you can imagine, they come to us because they're trying to figure out if there's an underlying genetic cause for their condition, which is very useful um, information to have to help guide their medical management, but it's also information that they can use to figure out the risk for other family members, children, siblings, and so on. So very often I get to know not just my patients, but their entire families as, as well. Um, and so I've been doing this for 10 years now, and traditionally my role has been um, to really help patients in both the pre-testing and post-testing stages um, of genetic testing. But uh, the past few years, I have been seeing a little bit of a, a changing trend where patients now come to clinic with their genetic test results in hand saying, help, can you, can you help me figure this out? Um, and so I have noticed this sort of very evident shift towards um, direct-to-consumer or what we call consumer-driven genetic testing, and that's really what I want to focus on um, talking about today. Okay. So before I get into that, I'm, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with this diagram, but just a brief uh, basic concepts on, in genetics. Um, we have 46 chromosomes in every cell in our body, all of them, uh, 23 that we get from our mother, 23 from our fathers. Um, and inside each chromosome are tightly packed, thousands of tightly packed units of DNA that we call gene. And each gene has a very specific sort of sequence of nucleotides or proteins. And it's this very specific order of nucleotides that help determine various traits of our health and well-being. So when we talk about genetic testing today, we're really talking about the process of reading the genetic sequence or spelling, so to speak, to try to figure out if there are any variations or changes in there that aren't typical and that may be contributing to disease. So there are several different types of genetic testing available, um, and they all have different applications, but the one that I'm going to focus on today are um, different types of genetic testing that impact health. Um, and traditionally, these types of genetic testing um, options were offered through medical institutions or research, um, academic research institutions, but as I said, that has been changing over the past few years or so. Um, and I'm sure most of you have seen these ads for direct-to-consumer testing companies pop up, especially when you're looking for internet inspiration for holiday gifts. There they are. I mean, it's hard to type um, any sort of genetics-related um, search term into Google and not find one of these ads. So it's a very effective campaign. And you know they're very popular as gifts. They come in these really pretty, attractive boxes. They have um, very attractive logos like welcome to you and unique like you. And um, with price tags as low as um, $49, it really is effective at, at marketing itself as a perfect holiday gift. And the numbers have shown that their marketing campaigns is extremely effective. So um, there has been a huge boom and up uptake of direct-to-consumer genetic testing in the United States since 2017. Um, and it makes one wonder, why such a jump? Why is it so popular? What has changed in the past few years? And as someone who may potentially be interested in doing direct-to-consumer testing, what are the questions and concerns that one should have or ask before um, do, basically under, undergoing direct-to-consumer genetic testing? Um, so we'll start with basically going over the traditional um, sort of process of genetic testing. Um, and I would say back in the old days, that used to mean you would meet with a specialized genetic healthcare provider, a geneticist or a genetic counselor. They would get your family history, your medical history, um, you know, have an in-depth discussion of which specific genes we should likely be testing for, and then 
most likely get a blood sample rather than the saliva, ship it off to some specialized lab in the country, and then a good eight to 12 weeks on average later, you get a call from your healthcare provider saying, we need you to come in and discuss these results with you. So it's a very involved process. It's a very involved process. There's a lot of um, conversation that, that typically used to happen. Um, however, direct-to-consumer testing is a lot more simplified. You go online, you select the test that you want, you you can buy it online, and then you know the, the, the kit gets to your home within a week, you submit a saliva sample, and the results are emailed directly to you within six to eight weeks. So the process is clearly much simpler, and it can be done without having to converse with a human being. And I think that is um, primarily one of the biggest reasons for its mass appeal, just the general convenience of it all. But in addition to that, there are many different types of direct-to-consumer testing options to, to, to choose from. Um, and the type that is most popular, I'm sure there are probably people in this room who have done it as well, is the um, ancestry test. But in addition to that, you can also do testing to try to um, figure out specific, your risk for specific um, hereditary disease traits, um, carrier screening for family planning purposes, um, lifestyle traits like how much exercise is best for your genetic makeup, pharmacogenetics, which tells you what medication you're, you're, you're better suited to take, what you're most, more likely to metabolize well, and, and also the uh, very popular, what we call entertainment traits. Um, the most recent one being a company called Winome that essentially tells you which wine you're most likely to enjoy based on your genetic makeup. Um, it even goes so far as to tell you the specific type of grape and the secondary wine flavors, but that's just one of many, many different examples. And here's a list of 30 different entertainment traits that you can um, be tested for. I've just highlighted the ones that made me laugh, but earwax type, fear of public speaking, and something called misophonia, which is hatred of the sound of chewing. Um, but apparently, there are genetic traits that help determine these characteristics in people. Um, so in any case, direct-to-consumer testing, on the whole, doesn't sound so bad. It's entertaining, it's affordable, it's convenient. It does empower people to learn more about their genetic health, so why is the medical community making such a fuss about it? What are the concerns? Um, I believe that knowledge is power, and I absolutely think that it is a great way to get people to be interested in learning more about their genetics, but I do think that there are some things that you need to think about before you decide to do one of these um, direct-to-consumer tests. The first one, I think, really comes up when we talk about predisposition or predictive testing. Um, this is testing for conditions that you are likely to have a predisposition to develop at some time in the future. And so the biggest question that you have to ask is, is that condition medically actionable? So in other words, if you were to learn that you have an increased risk to develop a particular condition, is there something that you can do or are there screening guidelines in place to help you prevent developing that condition? Um, and a solid example is, you know, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and if you are, uh, if, if anyone's unfamiliar with Alzheimer's, it's a neurodegenerative disorder. But if you're 30 years old and you decide that you want to be tested for this and you learn that you have an increased risk for it, what can you do to really reduce that risk? Um, truthfully, not a whole lot, unfortunately. Um, and that's not because there isn't, there aren't things that you can do to help, pre help protect your health. It's really, it really has a lot more to do with the fact that we don't fully understand what causes Alzheimer's disease. We know that there is a genetic trait which has, um, which contributes in part to it, but we're not fully um, cognizant of what other factors um, contribute to causing Alzheimer's disease. So it's really hard to pinpoint how to combat something when you don't fully understand how it occurs. Um, and so that therein lies the issue with sort of predictive testing. Um, there are factors beyond the genetic traits that these tests test for um, that can predispose a person to developing these conditions, and those are not accounted for with testing um, like this. And so this really hits, um, hits at the heart of the question, why do we do genetic testing? Um, 
if there's information that can can that is learned which cannot be used to really be managed medically, what is the purpose of genetic testing, and is that really helpful? Um, this is a conversation I have quite often with patients, and um, the one picture that comes to mind very often is this painting. It's a sort of Democles, and it really makes you think about if you had this information where you knew that you had an increased risk for something, but then there wasn't really a whole lot you could do about it, it does kind of hang over your head like, a little bit like this. Um, and so you need to really think about how do you deal with that kind of information? Are you someone who would be extremely anxious? Would it empower you? Would it reassure you? And those are really things to ask yourself before you decide to do something like direct-to-consumer testing. Um, it's also very important to remember that a lot of these disorders that are being tested for are not strictly genetic. And so um, in very many cases, you know, it's, I think it's appropriate to say your DNA is not your destiny. The second issue that comes up with direct-to-consumer testing is really the quality of results that you get back. Um, I think one of the reasons that direct-to-consumer testing is so affordable is because there's not a whole lot of robust interpretation that goes um, in the back end. So the actual sequencing itself is automated and done by machines, so that is not a terribly laborious process. But the interpretation of complex medical genetic information is where really all the effort goes into. And that's not happening with direct-to-consumer testing. Um, and so this is problematic because um, for the most part, most direct-to-consumer testing companies essentially provide your raw genetic data to a third-party company that does the interpretation, and there's no way to really account for um, quality control with some of those companies. And so you're not really in control of sort of um, the, the quality of interpretation that comes back from that. Um, one of the studies I wanted to point out which, which um, really proves this is a, a rather shocking study that was published in the Genetics and Medicine Journal last year. Um, they highlighted 50 cases of individuals who had had genetic testing through DTC testing um, and were found to have positive results, um, meaning high risk results for hereditary cancer um, variants. Um, and unfortunately, 40% of those results turned out to be false positives, meaning they were not validated or they're seen as benign variants in the generally healthy population. Um, and so I, I really think that you have to take it with a grain of salt when you get back one of these results, because this is alarming to um, clinicians. I mean, it's, it's, it's alarming because you can have a patient thinking that they have a high risk for a cancer genetic variant and taking that to their doctor and feeling like they need to, you know, do something about their health and be more empowered to get surgical intervention. Um, and unfortunately, that's not just a hypothetical scenario. Um, an unfortunate situation like that did occur earlier this year. Um, where a woman thought she had positive results and had a double mastectomy. Um, although her false positive results weren't from direct-to-consumer testing, it was from research results. I think this just showcases that without clinical confirmatory testing, you really shouldn't um, decide to take any medical action, and that's sort of the importance of having robust um, interpretation with your genetic test results. On the flip side, there's also a risk um, for false reassurance with negative results to direct-to-consumer testing. And the main reason for that is just because they're not testing for all the variants that are known to cause a specific condition. And so if you come back with a negative result for hereditary breast cancer, it doesn't mean you're quite out of the woods. It just means that they tested for a couple of markers and you don't have it. But it's not taking a very important component into consideration, which is family history. Um, and so that's something to think about as well. How, how does this testing calculate your residual risk in the face of a negative result? And then finally, the last issue that we really think, have to think about when we talk about direct-to-consumer testing is data storage. Um, one of the other reasons 
direct-to-consumer testing is so affordable is because whatever losses they um, incur at the front end by selling um, affordable kits, they make up for by um, selling large-scale data to third-party companies. Data is extremely valuable for medical research and for a lot of reasons, and so this is one of the best ways to accumulate genetic data on a large number of people. Um, and they actually do make a significant profit. To be clear, the, the data sold is de-identified. But um, I mean, I think your genetic code is as close to your identity as you're going to get, so it's a little misleading to say it's de-identified. Um, but really, the worry here is that this is very sensitive information, and it's stored by companies that don't necessarily have very regulated policies on how to protect and share your information. Um, and they're not bound by federal privacy laws like HIPAA because they're not medical providers. Um, and not to mention there's always this ever-increasing risk for data to be hacked. Um, and as I think one article um, in the New York Times had put it, you can change your credit card information if that gets hacked, but you can change your genetic information. And that's just something to be aware of when you decide to do one of these tests. So in summary, direct-to-consumer testing can be a really great way to empower yourself to learn more about your genetic health. But the process as it stands currently needs to be improved. Healthcare providers need to realize that patients um, and, and People had, there's a great demand for better access to genetic testing. And DTC companies need to take steps to provide that service um, to people with a lot more responsibility. So ideally, what needs to happen is um, that they should start thinking about a more medically integrated model of offering direct-to-consumer testing by incorporating better regulations um, for data privacy, specifically which genes to test, the testing methodology that's used, post, pre- and post-test client um, support, I would say. I think that's extremely important, um, as well as just being very clear on what is health-related and what is non-health-related. Um, and there are a lot of direct-to-consumer companies out there that have been taking steps to move towards such a model, and I think it's only going to get better. So I do think this is sort of the model um, of the future for genetic testing, but I think it needs some fine-tuning to, to really get to a, a good place. Um, so with that, I'll end with a message that while direct-to-consumer testing may seem like a really simple and fun process, I encourage consumers um, to analyze the pros and cons and think a little bit more deeply um, about those before you click on the add to cart for your holiday shopping list this year. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. That was very interesting. Definitely answered a lot of questions that I've had about my uh, doing any of those tests. I personally have never done one, but my brother did. So, I mean, it's basically like my DNA, I feel like, in there too. So perfect, glad he made that decision for us. Okay, um, Dr. Eleanor Carlson is Associate Professor in Bioinformatics and Integrated Biology at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and Director of Vertebrae Genomics at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Dr. Carlson has a special interest in dog genetics, wonderful. And her International Darwin's Arc Project invites all dog owners to enroll their dogs in an open data research project exploring the genetic basis of dog behavior, as well as diseases such as compulsive disorders, food allergies, and cancer. Great. Okay, so dogs and genetics, and what does it mean for my dog? So I'm gonna talk about dogs, or rather this species here. Um, so on the left, it's actually a wolf puppy, and on the dog, all right, it's a dog puppy. They're different in really interesting ways. Um, dogs have all sorts of changes in their digestive system so that they can eat our food and changes in their behavior so that they can live near us and things like that. Um, and to study these guys, as they mentioned, I have the citizen science project, which I'll talk about later on. Um, but I did want to, just wanted to start with full disclosure here. So I work in dog genetics, and I have since my PhD, and everybody thinks I must be super into dogs. And I've never actually owned a dog. I have cats. And this photo is somewhat deceptive because these are actually my cats now, so it's slightly embarrassing. Four cats seems like one too many cats, but they're fantastic. Um, and I don't do any cat genetics yet, but who knows. 
Um, but I'm going to talk about these guys. Uh, these are the, the uh, subjects that we work with, pet dogs. Um, and I'm going to talk about genomics, or the genome. And I always put this slide in because the genome sounds really scary and people don't know what the word means. But basically, as was mentioned in the last talk, thank you very much, um, your genome are basically, it's basically the DNA you get from your parents. So you get half of it from your mother, half of it from your father, and together that makes your genome. And it's basically just a string of A's, C's, G's, and T's. A lot of them, like three billion of them. It's huge. And basically, we've gotten really good at reading off that string of ACs, Gs, and Ts with technology over the last 20 years. The first time we tried to do it, it took us 13 years to do basically one individual. And now we're basically generating one every six minutes at one of the institutes that I work at. So it's a completely different kind of scope of data that we're dealing with. We can sequence DNA. We can do it really easily and really well. The problem is that we don't actually really understand what it does. And so in the first talk, it was mentioned that one of the things we look at are genes, and that's great. But it turns out that out of those three billion letters of DNA in our genome, about one and a half percent of it is actually genes. We think that probably like 10% of it is probably important in some way. We don't know why the other 90% is there. I always tell people when I talk to students that this is really good news because it means that we're all going to have jobs in genetics for a really long time. Um, but so why is dog genetics a thing? Obviously, cats are superior animals, but, you know, dogs are cool too. So dogs were domesticated from wolves uh, more than 15,000 years ago. This has been very um, c contentious. Lots of people have opinions about how this happened and where it happened and when it happened. And the most recent data suggests that it's all very confusing because the wolves that dogs actually descended from aren't around anymore and the wolves that are around are a sister species. So they're, sorry, not a sister species, but a sister kind of clade. But anyway, so that was about 15,000 years ago, first domesticated animal. Dog breeds are actually really new. So they probably are, for the most part, not any less than 100, any more than 100 to 200 years old. They basically got really excited about genetic purity back in Victorian England and started creating dog breeds. And this is where we're defining a dog breed as being a population of dogs where everybody in that population is basically related to each other. You can't be in that breed unless you're already in that breed. It's defined by who your parents are. If both your parents are in that breed, you're in that breed. So it's a genetically isolated population. There's very strong selection, primarily on physical traits. There's not very much genetic diversity. And because there's not a lot of genetic diversities, you'll often have certain diseases that become very common within particular breeds. As a result of these characteristics, geneticists got really excited about dogs because for various complicated reasons, that made it much easier to find genes and find genetic variants that were linked to diseases in dogs. So for about 10 years, people ran around doing many different genetic studies in purebred dogs. So these are within purebred populations, genetic mapping studies primarily. And as a consequence of that, today we have a whole lot of, um, actually several different genetic testing companies that are selling basically the equivalent of direct-to-consumer testing for humans but for dogs. The problem is, is that the data that we have um, isn't, I would like to have all the problems that we have in human genetics and dog genetics. Um, we're just, we're about 15 years behind, I think, right now. Um, and the thing to remember whenever anybody's talking about genetics, either in humans or in dogs, and anybody that actually understands the genetics will tell you this, is that we don't know a lot more than we do know. This is really just the beginning of this field of research, and we're just starting to figure things out. Um, but let's go back to dog genetics, or this probably applies to pet genetics in general. Um, there's a few people kind of getting into this space with cats now. But the first problem we have is that we haven't asked the right, we haven't answered the right questions. So one example of this is this disease called DM, or degenerative myelopathy that dogs will develop sometimes when they're older. Um, it's very similar to human ALS, and it's actually used as what we call a natural model. So a, a similar, it's a disease where you can look at how the disease progresses in the same way you would look at it in humans. Um, it's a terrible disease. It's a, it's a degenerative disease. Your dog slowly loses the ability to walk and eventually they will die and there's no treatment for it. So several, many years, that's about 10 years ago now, um, scientists did a study looking at corgis and tried to find the ge a genetic mutation that was correlated with this disease. And they did it, and it was a beautiful science. They did something called a genome-wide association study and found a mutation in a gene called SOD1 that cases, dogs that had this disease were more likely to have this mutation than dogs who didn't. Great science, no problems there. But the characteristic of this mutation that a lot of people missed, and they followed up with a study several years ago looking at this, is that even though dogs that had the mutation were much more, li were more likely to get the disease than dogs who didn't, the mutation is extremely common. 
So in some of the breeds, more than half of the dogs have this mutation. The disease is incredibly rare. Just because your dog has this mutation, they're still very unlikely to actually get the disease. And so we kind of go from the scientist question, which is can we find a genetic change that's more common in the affected dogs? Can this tell us something about the biology of the disease? To the owner's question, which is my dog Petunia, who's 11 years old, just tested positive for this mutation. What are the chances that they're going to develop this disease? That's what the owners actually want to know. And the answer to that question is we don't know. We've never done those studies. Basically, to do that study, what you have to do is you have to go get thousands of dogs find out how many of them have the mutation, and then look at how many of them end up getting the disease. It's kind of a survey perspective. Of it. It's basically testing the ability, for you, ability to predict the disease. And that's not what the original study did. Even though the original study was very good, it wasn't asking this question. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing with genetic testing in pets, um, the human genetic testing is kind of like the Wild West. And then dog genetic testing is a whole new degree past that because there's nobody regulating what they do in this space. You don't know the accuracy of the genetic tests that you're getting from companies. They tend to be developed only in small numbers of purebred dogs. And the power for predicting disease, as I said, isn't known. And then finally, veterinarians are not trained in clinical genetics. They don't know how to interpret these tests. You have companies that are telling people to take these reports to their veterinarian and learn what it means, but the veterinarians don't know what it means. And this is really challenging work. That's why we have genetic counselors. And so I think this is something to really keep in mind when you're trying to understand how to interpret these tests. And we actually did write this little article about it um, last year, a couple years ago. I put up an easy link to it at my, my lab website, carlsonlab.org slash pets. But basically, it kind of gets into the story, all the different problems that we were seeing with the testing. And this was really inspired by the fact that one of the veterinarians, authors, Lisa Moses, works at Angel Animal Hospital. And I was talking to her, and I was absolutely horrified when I discovered that these genetic tests were being used to make clinical decisions. Because I'd been involved in the studies, I knew exactly how good the studies were and what their limitations were, and I suddenly realized that any paper that I published that had a genetic association in it, somebody could pick up and start selling a test, even if that was an entirely inappropriate use of that, of that result, and that really worried me. Um, the second problem we have is tiny data sets. So as was mentioned in the first talk, most traits are complex. So they're influenced both by your environment and also by changes in possibly thousands of genes. And so rather than it being a yes, no, you've got dogs that are less likely to be retrieving because they've got fewer genetic variants linked to retrieving, and then dogs that are more likely to be retrievers because they've got more genetic variants linked to retrieving. They figured this out in humans too. And what happens when you have something that's complicated and involves many genes and the environment is that you need very big sample sizes in order to be able to actually find association. So for schizophrenia, they first found genes that were significantly connected to the disease with about 150,000 people in their studies. And we were doing dog genetic studies with a couple of hundred dogs. We just didn't have the power. Um, and so this is why Darwin's Ark was started. This is a project that my lab runs. Um, and it was originally Darwin's dogs, but I wanted species flexibility, so we rebranded. Anyway, so this is a citizen science project. This means that it's an open data model. We don't own the data. We're not going to sell the data. We'll share the data with any scientist at any point in time. We feel like dog owners are contributing to our research by telling us about their dogs. And in, as a result, we want to actually give back by actually making these big data sets available. And if everybody keeps on doing genetic studies in silos all over the place, we're never going to have the sample sizes that we need to do this well. Um, at this point in time, we've got about 23,500 dogs actually signed up at Darwin's Ark. And this is not going to surprise anybody in this room. Dog owners really like talking about their dogs. <laughs> so they've answered about 2.5 million questions for us at this point in time. It's very exciting. And I think we've actually done genetic sequencing on about 1,500 of them. So, oh, and then the final problem we have here is that our data sets are biased. This is an issue that's come out in human genetics where people kind of, um, for some reason, kept on looking at the genetics of white people from Europe and forgot about the rest of the world for a very long time. And they've, suddenly they've discovered that this is actually a problem and that you want to look at people from other places as well. And we actually had a very similar problem in dog genetics where basically all of the studies we've done are in purebred dog populations, mostly from America or from Europe. And they're dogs like this. So on our citizen science website, one of the things we do if you run the genetics on your dog is that we'll tell you what breeds we think are in your dog. 
And many of them are like Hubble here. So we basically go across the DNA, and at each point we say, which breed does this chunk of DNA match the closest? And when we did this with Hubble, we got mostly either poodle or golden retriever. There's always a little chunk of the DNA that we're just not super confident about, so it'll come back as not matched. And we have a few slivers that are from closely related breeds, but Hubble is, in fact, a golden doodle. And that's exactly what his DNA is telling us. One of the things that surprised us was that actually most of the mixed breed dogs that we looked at were far more complicated than Hubble. Everybody kind of looks at a dog and asks, what are the two breeds that are in your dog? It's a mix of this and this. And it turns out most of the mutts in America are not a mix of this and this. Well, they are, but there's a ton of other things in it as well. So Marty's owner, I thought this was hilarious because we ran the genetics on her dog and she's like, I really want to find out what's in him because he's got spots and everybody tells me that he must have Dalmatian in him. And that's just silly. They're just saying that because of the spots. And then we ran the genetics and Dalmatian came out as a top breed. It was pretty funny. So, but this is Marty. And we actually, oh, we put up this website. It's super fun. So we put up some of our more complicated dogs and asked people to guess what they thought the top three breeds were in the dogs. Um, I think we had about 30,000 people go and guess. The website's still up. It's actually quite fun. Also, just so you know, really hard, um, which was kind of the point. Um, and then I just wanted to end by talking about this dog. Um, her name is Zako. She's from an island called Moritz, which is off the coast of Madagascar, which is off the coast of Africa, so very far, far away. And the reason I wanted to talk about Zako, Zako was um, adopted by this person, Rebecca Skloot, um, who wrote a book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks about genetics a few years ago, or kind of about genetics. Anyway, so she adopted Zako, took Zako back to California, and she called me up. <laughs> So Zeko, oh, Zeko now has an Instagram page. You can follow Zeko, the monkey dog, on Instagram. And she called me up and she says, could you run the genetics on Zeko and tell me what she is? And I said, I would love to run the genetics on Zeko, and I'm almost 100% sure I'm not going to be able to tell you anything about her genetics. And she agreed to do it anyway, which is kind of surprising. But anyway, so we went ahead. And so this is basically what's happening. 15,000 years ago or more, you've got dog domestication. 100 to 200 years ago, you've got modern breeds. If you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous that we all go around thinking that all of our dogs have to be mixes of modern breeds, when modern breeds are only a couple hundred years ago and they're mostly from Europe. Most of the dogs on this planet, probably about 80%, are from, ju they're just dogs. They live with humans, they're village dogs, and they basically just, they don't have any breed ancestry, they're just dogs. And so when we run Zeko's DNA, what comes back is basically we call these rainbow dogs when they come back because we haven't figured out exactly how to detect the whole not being a breed thing yet. But basically our algorithm goes across the genome and each chunk it says, what breed is this? What breed is this? And it basically cannot figure it out. So it's just making random guesses everywhere. And you basically come out with tiny chunks of every single breed out there. It's fantastic and hilarious. And it just is basically saying that Zeko is not a breed dog. She's just a dog. Um, so I, I, I always give these talks and I'm like a, I'm a genomics genetics person and I keep on telling people all the problems with what we do. So just so everyone here is clear, genetics is fantastic and powerful. Um, even within our lab right now, we're doing things like looking for ways to better diagnose and treat dogs and humans for diseases like cancer. We've got a project looking at how we can breed healthier, more successful working dogs. We're hoping that'll actually spread to the pet dog community too. And maybe eventually we might be able to do things like have a genetic test that would be able to predict which rescue dogs might be better suited to particular jobs rather than going out to a pet home. There's a lot of potential there if we actually had really big sample sizes. However, and I think everybody in this room could be aware of the fact of, what, of these kinds of things, is that there's also a lot of risks when you get into those kinds of ideas and how do we actually use technology that could potentially be that powerful responsibly. So, and I have a fantastic lab group. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, I've had a rainbow dog for sure, or two in my life, and I feel like it looks basically exactly like that dog. <laughs> um, awesome. So our next speaker is Dr. Mark Stokel. He's a senior research associate in the program for the human environment at the Rockefeller University, which is right next door. He helped establish DNA barcoding as a practical tool for identifying animal and plant species by DNA. His DNA barcoding work with high school students attracted wide attention, including front page articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Since 2015, he has been advancing environmental DNA, or eDNA, at a low cost, low as a low cost, low impact tool for monitoring ocean animals, which is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm gonna talk about uh 
using DNA, new ways that DNA is helping understand how, help us monitor environmental health. Uh, just as a, a little background, as I mentioned, I was involved early on in DNA barcoding, which was something, a concept invented by a Canadian scientist in 2003, saying we could use DNA as a standard identification system to identify uh, plants and animals just by looking at a very short stretch of DNA. And just shown schematically here, and so he said we could call it, because it's a short stretch, it's a bunch of letters, uh, we can call them barcodes, same way you would identify a product. Uh, it, if you look at the barcode region, this is about 100 base pairs represented in color bars of two birds and two kinds of uh, bees, uh, with lines in between showing uh, where the differences are. You can see there are enough differences to tell a hermit thrush from an American robin even if you only look at 100 nucleotides. And that's out of the 3 billion or so if we look at uh, the size of the whole genome. So you just need a little tiny bit of DNA to know what species it is. Uh, this has a lot of practical applications. Early on, uh, my daughter, when I was working on this, my daughter's uh, now a physician at, at New York Hospital. She said when she was in high school, she said, can we use it to test sushi? I said, yeah, I guess so. Nobody's done that. Uh, so she and her friend went around and bought sushi in our neighborhood. And I helped them send it off for testing. And it came back, a quarter of it was mislabeled, always as something more expensive or more desirable. You know, if you think about it, if you look at a piece of fish, particularly if it's white, you really don't know what it is. And it turns out it's often uh, substituted. They were, that got a lot of attention. They were on the front page of the New York Times. They were on morning television, and it was in newspapers around the world. And this is the thing, the one thing that I've done, this project with my daughter that I'm best known for. I'm never going to reach this uh, level again, but it was a great project. Uh, and what we're doing now is taking that same idea using little bits of DNA, but instead we're just collecting water samples like uh, this much water from the East River out here, I can tell you what fish live there. And the reason that's true is because there's little cells and bits of the animals, you can think of it as dandruff of fish floating around in the water. And we can use the new sequencing technologies, which like you would use at a crime scene just to detect little traces of DNA and sort out mixtures of DNA to tell what species you have. Uh, so, and the process, it's pretty simple. Uh, around here, we throw a bucket in the water, we bring water back to the lab, we filter it. Uh, the little, whatever's floating in the water doesn't go through the filter, we extract DNA from that, and then we sequence that DNA and, and we match it uh, to a library. Just like you would match it to a database of criminals, we match it to a database of species. Uh, it, from uh, a lot of people's work, we can say the DNA in the water lasts a few days. It's lost through degradation and, and, and just dilution. And so if you detect it, it means the animal is nearby. Uh, if it lasted forever, then every animal in the world would be in the water. Uh, and it would be the same everywhere. But it's convenient. It's relatively short-lived. So we started in 2015. We went to Central Park. Uh, with uh, two high school students. I've continued to do a lot of work with high school students, Iman and Alden. They collected water, and we found the species. We did the DNA analysis, and it worked. Uh, this is our, one of our first samples incredibly well, so we could detect these are pretty much all the species of fish that live uh, up in this part of the park. You can also find other animals. DNA makes it into the water. There's uh, human DNA, dog, uh, rats. We get whenever we're water around New York City, we get rat and some birds and raccoon. And if you compare it to the traditional way of seining or electrofishing, it's a pretty close match. So uh, 
And it's obviously easier just to collect water than it is to put a net in the water. Uh, uh, we went on to do a, a bigger study of the Hudson and the East River, and you can see the comings and goings of fishes around New York City. This shows data from the Hudson River around 90th Street. Uh, we collected water about once, once a week, uh, starting in the spring, uh, ending in December, and you can, this shows number of fish species, and you can see uh, in a black here indicates we detected that species, and you can see a lot of fish come into New York City uh, in the uh, uh, early spring and summer. And then when the water gets colder, that's the blue here, uh, they leave. Some of these are things that fishermen would catch, like striped bass. Uh, some of them we don't catch because they don't bite hooks, like menhaden, but it's very important. And we get some very rare things, like Atlant Atlantic sturgeon. This is a uh, federally endangered species, and we can there's a lot of effort to monitor them and how many of them, and this is, uh, gives us another way of doing that. Uh, and uh, Lubov was a student who helped building up the library with that. Uh, she got a nice interview on local television. The story was in the Washington Post. Uh, we went out to, uh, next year we went out to Coney Island, uh, site of Nathan's and the Thunderbolt. Uh, the hardest part of this project was actually taking the Q train every week out to Coney Island. I don't know if any of you are from Coney Island or you commute there. It's 27 stops. And uh, uh, somehow the seats aren't, don't have any cushion on the, uh, finally I learned to bring a pillow. But uh, uh, anyway, this was a lot of fun. We went out, there's a nice new pier, uh, Steeplechase Pier they built after the old one was knocked down by Sandy. Uh, we went out there, there were a lot of fishermen, they wanted to know what we were doing, but we th threw a bucket overboard, collected the water, brought it back to the lab. And you can see, starting in March, March, April, May, June, July, August, there are not many species in the early spring, except some like winter flounder we get in the winter. Uh, as the water gets warmer, then a lot more fish uh, start to show up. And at Coney Island, we can even pick up a uh, bottlenose dolphin. Uh, there are a lot of dolphins in the, uh, around New York City now in the summer, and they sometimes come into the outer harbor here near Coney Island. Uh, you can use eDNA to tell whether the things we're doing, are we helping the environment? There's a lot of effort to restore herrings, alewife and other herrings, uh, that used to be very abundant and now are gone from uh, a lot of our rivers. And they, either they do restocking or building a fish ladder so they can get around a dam or actually removing dams. This is a project with a uh, high school student, went up to the Bronx River, went all along the Bronx River, which is the only real river in Manhattan. So East River is not a river, it's a tidal strait water goes both ways, but Bronx River is actually a river. Uh, it used to have uh, herring alewife in it. For the past 10 years, New York City's been bringing herring from Connecticut and every spring and introducing them into the river. I don't think they like it there because we couldn't detect anything. So I think as soon as they get there, they go back to Connecticut. <laughs> but anyway, it's an in inexpensive way of doing environmental monitoring restoration. This summer, we went to the Gowanus Canal. Is anyone here from Brooklyn? Uh, so Gowanus is, for New Yorkers, is legendary as a polluted waterway. It was a super fun site in 2010. It used to have a lot of industrial pollution. Most of that's been eliminated. It still has a lot of sewage overflow, although that's gotten better. And the city and state have put in a flushing system, so there's a big uh, set of turbines that bring water in from the East River and, and pump water through the canal to try to uh, get it to be fresher. But uh, no one has done a fish survey since 2010. We, I went with a student and we collected uh, uh, water from various points along the uh, canal. And we actually got lots of fish DNA out of the water. I was surprised. And some species, like right here, if you compare it to what we found in the harbor, uh, they're more common in the canal. 
So I think there really are, it really is improved. There really are fish there. This gives us another way of uh, monitoring the health of what's going on. We got the Gowanus dredgers as a, uh, a local uh, environmental group, and they were very excited. They put it on our findings on their Instagram uh, site. Uh, so what we've learned so far, we from the eDNA, from the water, we can tell uh, where fish are. This shows some more data from, this is New Jersey. If you collect water from the ocean or from the bay, it's a barrier island like Fire Island, you get ocean fish DNA in the ocean side and you get bay fish DNA in the bay side. So even though water is flowing back and forth, what we detect is it really is where the fish are. Big changes over the course of the season, like I showed in the Hudson, this is a year and a half, number of species in a sample in the bay and number of species in the ocean. Uh, and similarly, we can see the, most of these are warm water species. This is looking separately at sharks and rays. We didn't detect any great white sharks. So I was happy about that. Uh, these are just some little sharks, smooth dogfish, which is a warm water species. We get the DNA in the warm months. And spiny dogfish is a cold water species, and we get the DNA in the cold water months. So it's a very good picture of what's, uh, what's in the water. Uh, and we can find things that no one knows are there. One of the things we found looking at the sharks and rays, we, didn't, we found this DNA, we didn't know what it was, didn't match anything in the databases. Uh, we went down the list of all the rays that are known to be in New Jersey. We got DNA from all of those. It didn't match any of those. So, well, maybe it's something that lives somewhere else. So uh, it was similar to cow nose ray and there's a related species called the Brazilian cow nose ray, which uh, is centered around Brazil, but comes up into the Gulf of Mexico. But from our data, it's actually up here in New Jersey. Now, maybe this is water's getting warmer. Uh, it looks very, very similar to this other species, cow nose ray. So I think people that are catching them don't realize there actually is another species there. So. Uh, it shows the power of genetics. You can find things that you wouldn't be able to find uh, any other way. And uh, other things we've learned so far, it's not just for fish. We can detect dolphin, as I said, like at Coney Island, this shows data from New Jersey. Occasionally we can pick up the whales. There's a project using eDNA that's being run by the New York Zoological Society now, seeing if they can track uh, the humpback whales, which are actually quite abundant uh, visitors to New York, uh, the outer harbor uh, in the late summer and early fall. And we can detect in the late winter and uh, early spring uh, harbor seals uh, uh, also. We, I, we're hoping the harbor seals don't get any more common than they are. I don't know if you followed the, what's happened in, on Cape Cod. There are uh, tens of thousands of seals on Monomoy Island on Cape Cod, and as a result, they have a large, they have about 300 great white sharks that spend most of the summer uh, eating the seals, but they've also had attacks on uh, surfers there. So it, habitat restoration is good. We want animals to come back, but sometimes things happen that we're not uh, really uh, hoping for. Uh, this is a project uh, I worked on with a, another a student. He was a finalist in the Google, international finalist, Google Science Fair, using eDNA to look uh, for river otters. So it's a, it's a new tool. It's very versatile. It's relatively inexpensive. Just like anyone can swap their cheek and send in a sample, anyone can collect water. Uh, so. Uh, our next steps are comparing it to the traditional methods we're working with uh, the New Jersey Bureau of Marine Fisheries to compare it directly to a trawl survey. Blue, this is data from June. Blue means the species was detected by both methods. So there's a big, this is a pretty good overlap. And the things that are abundant by the trawl are also abundant by the eDNA. Uh, and if you talk about cost, this is the main way we, we count fish in the ocean. We 
put a boat out there with a trawl. This is $10,000 a day just to put the boat in the water. So uh, uh, you, uh, collecting water is uh, going to be the way of the future. Uh, we want it to become uh, kits. There actually is a company that you can test your own lake water. You can uh, send it off. And the future will be a, some sort of automated robotic weather stations that do the water sampling, potentially do the DNA analysis, and send uh, the information ashore. So uh, we have all the individual parts of this. We don't have the th one thing that does it all together. But these are autonomous. Uh, again, it's cheaper to send out one of these. This is about this big. It's solar powered. Uh, and it can sample uh, water and send back a signal. This is an underwater autonomous vehicle. This is a, a, a float. So uh, we're going to know a lot more about the health of the ocean in the future than we know right now. Thank you. Um, OK, so the next portion is that we're going to have a little bit of a panel discussion. You guys really touched on a lot of the questions that I've come up with. Okay, um, so these are mostly just general questions. Anyone, feel free to jump in. Um, so why is the role of genetics in One Health so important since that's what we're focused on today? That's a big question. I know. <laughs> give, your, give your most concise answer. <laughs> I think that the interesting thing about DNA is it's basically the same thing in all the species, which means that all of a sudden we have a technology where we can look at fish or we can look at bacteria or we can look at dogs or we can look at humans using the same technology to ask different kinds of questions. And that's opened up a lot of opportunities. In the past, it used to be that in order to do certain kinds of genetic studies, you had to spend a couple of years developing exactly the right tool for your species in order to be able to do that measurement. And you just couldn't go out and just sequence water and find out what was in it. And so there was a big problem with like not even knowing what was out there. We were only asking the questions about things we already knew were there to ask questions about. And so I think that's really changed things. All of a sudden, we can look at any species and start um, asking some really interesting questions. Yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, genetics, DNA is like a very powerful flashlight. And, you know, uh, the world is a cave, and now we can shine, we can see things we couldn't see before. There, uh, sometimes I get asked, what about Loch, the Loch Ness Monster? Uh, and there actually was a very nice eDNA study of Loch Ness. And I'm sorry to report that they did not find the Loch Ness monster. How, how would you know, you might say, but you would know <laughs> because it would be something that looks sort of like a reptile. You know, the sequence is similar. Even if you don't know exactly what the thing is, you can usually get an idea. It must be in this group of animals. This is maybe a question a teenager would ask, but yeah. in that same vein, how about if you know when people commit murder and like dump a body in a, a, a like would that be useful in that area? Do you uh, think instead a, of like sending people out? There's uh, there's so much human DNA uh, like in the water around in the East River in the Hudson. Yeah. I, I think in principle it can work. I know the military is interested in using eDNA to track who's on a submarine. Yeah. They okay. want to know the individual. They want to be able to identify individuals, which is not, that's a whole other level of difficulty to identify an individual right. versus a species. But I don't know. The technology is powerful. Maybe we'll be doing that. All right. There you go. All right. and just kind of the, the evil, like, future... Right, you know, that's number, where we, my we, mind we, goes. We leave DNA everywhere. <laughs> what happens when we can actually look at all of it? <laughs> it's true. Um, you know, and I think we, we touched on this question, but since this is a room full of animal lovers, um, we know that similar tests are now available for dogs and even cats, for example, in Bark, which we spoke about together earlier. So do you think that these tests are the, comparable to the human version? Do you think there's a clinical use for these tests yet, and should they be recommended to owners to help with more individualized care, which again, a lot of people are bringing these tests into us as veterinarians, and um, we're at this time having a little bit of difficulty interpreting them, so. 
from a genetic standpoint, I think I'm in the same place you mentioned you were um, in your talk, which is that I personally think it's amazingly fantastic that everybody is interested in learning something about DNA. It's cool that people are interested in science, and I would be the last person to say don't do it because you could find some really interesting, I, you can get some interesting information out of it. Um, but everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. We cannot predict what kind of wine you are going to like by looking at your DNA. We can, we can predict what kind of earwax you have by looking at your DNA. That's actually a pretty solid one. And so I know that because I've sat in endless seminars listening to people tell me about the research they're doing on these tests, but it's very hard when you come in as a consumer to, sit, to look at the information they're giving you and be able to tell apart, this is something I actually need to worry about versus this is something that could be useful information or I should just take it as a joke because it doesn't mean anything at all. And you may not even as a person, there's personality differences too in how you interpret those kinds of results. And so I think it, it ends up being very similar to the, to the human world in terms of a lot of the, the human problems that come into genetic testing, in a way. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so Priyanka touched on this a little bit, but I don't know, to me this was important. I think a lot of people don't consider this when they're sending in their genetic information. So maybe we can just reiterate a couple of things, but currently who has access to these DNA test results and could these, this pose problems now or in the future in terms of privacy or insurance coverage um, along those lines? Um, so I think that's a question, that's a very good question and that's something that's always in the back of my mind, whether we're talking about direct to consumer testing, even clinical testing. Um, I think it depends on the, every specific lab has their own policy and who they're allowed to share data with. And I think if you were, if we were in 2010, you exactly as you said, it, it's a wild, wild west. I mean, the absolute wild, wild west. Um, but because people are becoming more and more cognizant about these privacy issues, a lot of direct-to-consumer testing companies um, now very explicitly say who they will not share your data with, but they don't necessarily say who they will share your data with. Um, for example, 23andMe, which is one of the most popular direct-to-consumer testing companies, very explicitly say in their privacy policy that they will not share data with insurance companies. Um, but they have um, more recently shared data, a large amount of data with um, pharmaceutical companies and for good reasons. They're trying to further medical research. So I think it really depends. Um, but for the most part, I think people try to be very cognizant about not sharing data with insurance companies because that can really affect um, things like life insurance, which we don't have policy, policies in place right now to protect against. What about dog insurance? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, it's not it a joke. Real. It actually is a real <laughs> thing. Pre, uh, like, it could be considered a pre-existing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, luckily or unluckily, we can't really predict diseases super well in dogs yet. Um, we're already essentially doing the equivalent of genetic screening because if you have dogs in particular breeds, you're going to get a different insurance rate because yeah, that yeah. breed has a high risk of genetic diseases because of its genetic background. So in a sense, genetic testing will eventually just get it much more specific to the individual versus the breed. Um, and so you're, you, you could end up in a situation where some people are happy because they have a dog in that breed that's not at risk, so all of a sudden their rates drop. But then you've got other people that the rates go up for everybody else. So I think it's something that it's going to be an issue, um, whether it's a, I mean, when, so with our open, with our citizen science project, we've kind of taken the direction of saying that we're not going to share any, we don't share any of the owner's information, obviously, and we don't identify the dog um, by anything other than its first name in our data. But once, as you said, it is DNA, um, it is eventually uniquely identifiable. And so we just try to make sure that everybody's really clear on what that genetic information is. On the flip side of it, one of the powerful things about dog genetics is that we can share data more readily than you can in human medicine and all of the legal restrictions that are there for very good reasons around sharing data in human medicine has the side effect of slowing a lot of projects down as you have to jump through a lot of hoops. I mean I can understand why 23andMe is not saying who they will share data with because you might say, don't share my data with anybody, but then if you actually went and had a conversation later saying, we want to share with the company that's developing the new drug for schizophrenia, you'd be like, oh, of course you use my data for that. And so it gets very hard when it's very hard to anticipate now how things are going to be in 10 years in a field that moves as fast as ours does. 
And I also think it's important to recognize that they're not sharing individual data. This is really aggregate, like large scale data that, that is useful for scientific research. So that's important. Too. It is, yeah. although they recently discovered that there's problems with that approach as well. So one of the strengths of the, the dog genetics is that we can share, as I said, not the, ident not the names, but we can share the individual data more easily, which means, because the summary, it's something called summary statistics where you basically say this is the information we're getting from the set of individuals as opposed to any information about an individual which means you don't have to worry about identifying people but it also means that when you have weird things going on in your data set to have to do with calling errors and mm -hmm. things like that or the maybe the ancestry of the individuals makes signal false signals or something you can't actually detect that in the summary statistics so it's kind of like a it's a light side and a dark side kind of thing <laughs> Okay, we're just gonna do one last question and then we're gonna open up to audience questions. So what interdisciplinary approaches or projects would you like to see for the future of genetic testing? Matching dog personalities with their owners? I don't know. <laughs> that would be great. That would um, be helpful. We, <laughs> we actually have this totally side note, but one of the things that's interesting in dogs is that there's this signal that comes out of a lot of the personality surveys where they'll come out with smaller dogs tending to be more aggressive. And everybody <laughs> blames this on genetics, which I think is incredibly unfair because if you think about it, small dogs live in a fundamentally different environment than big dogs do because small dogs live in a world where they get picked up. And big dogs live in a world where they don't get picked up. So maybe if you don't like getting picked up, then you're going to bark a lot. Who knows? Um, but one of the things I'd really like to do with genetics, because we've got some fancy ways we think we might be able to use the mixed breed dogs to try and untangle size from behavior and see whether there's actually anything there if it's really just all the environment. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested in uh, anything about longevity. I think um, struck dogs among animals, they're relatively short-lived. And whether it'd be great if you learn something, you know, from what you're doing about uh, determinants of uh, longevity. It's funny to say that. We're actually partner, partners with a project that's just starting out of Seattle and Texas A&M called, creatively enough, the Dog Aging Project, okay. um, which is going to be looking at exactly that, at um, how dogs age over time. It's a really powerful opportunity because um, if you're worried about humans and human aging, then it's you might actually see benefits within your lifetime as opposed to waiting for all the humans to age alongside you and seeing what happens. It doesn't work very well. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity that you don't have in other species simply because dogs live in our homes. Um, you can't replicate that with anything else. It's their natural environment. They're sharing an environment with us. If there's risk factors in the environment, they'll often be exposed to the same ones. So, um, and they get things like cognitive decline and things like that. So. You're right, it's super interesting and I'm, I'm really curious to see where it goes. Great, and the number one question I get from most people is how long will my dog live? So I'd love that information as soon as it's available, <laughs> please. Then you get the whole question though, do you want to know? <laughs> yeah, people wanna know. <laughs> they love asking me that question. And I give them my best guess. Okay, um, great, so now we're gonna open up the questions to everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Is there a way for the consumer to know which analyses have been well validated in a direct-to-consumer testing kits? Like, for instance, if I wanted to know chances, you know, if I have a genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's compared to if I want to know if I have a predisposition for perfect pitch, you know, is one more likely to be accurate than the other, you know, the result? Oh, and how would the consumer know? Does it, yeah. yeah. Good questions. Um, so, uh, as I said in my talk, there are companies that are moving towards really good practice models in terms of making sure that their results are validated. And one of the best ways to be able to determine that is um, looking at who is doing their sequencing as well as who's doing the interpretation. So um, just as an example, there's a company called Helix Genetics that's now partnered with, I think, it's Baylor, um, Med the Baylor Medical Group, or one of the big medical groups. And I think just having that extra sort of pair of eyes, reputable pair of eyes, sort of looking at the information, it does help um, 
not that it's a guarantee, um, but I think that definitely just um, because those clinical labs do have validation of results. And so as long as they're partnering with one of those kind of labs, it, it definitely um, is a little bit more reputable than I would say like 23andMe or some other company. Oh, and I would, I would say as a general rule of thumb, um, the more certain they are in their prediction, the more likely it is to not be real. So genetics is very difficult and predicting things is very hard. And so even, so 23andMe actually does a nice job with a lot of their traits of telling you what that means in numbers. The problem is, is that those numbers don't mean a whole lot to people. Um, but I remember looking at their results because I did it a couple of years ago and um, I was going through it and they were asking, they were predicting things about me, like whether I had photic sneeze, which is where you sneeze when you look at the sun and things like that. And it told me it didn't, I didn't, which I got very offended by because I do. Um, and then if you look at the numbers, it's like a 52% versus 48, but it's nearly a random guess, but not quite, basically. Um, the other thing that came out of that is I really wanted a button to push that would tell, so I could tell them that they were wrong about it and they didn't have one. So in my dog project, when we actually start rolling this kind of thing out, we've done it with the breed tests now. So after we give the breed results, we always ask people, do you think we got these results right? And if we, they say no, we ask them why not. Um, and actually immediately uncovered a couple of places where there were sample swaps. Um, sometimes when people order two kits at the same time, they're not very good about keeping straight which dog they're swabbing. Mm -hmm. And so we got, they gotten them backwards as we are actually able to fix it. But it actually is really interesting to find out, to actually have that interchange. And that's important because we, we understand only a little bit about it now. So the more they're looking for information from you, I think that's always a good sign that they're, they're having a conversation. It's not just, we've made this amazing prediction with genetics and it's genetics, so you should trust it, kind of thing. Hi, I think I have two questions for Mark. Um, so, you say that when you collect water samples, you uh, analyze the DNA and you compare it to a library. I think my first question is, who built the library and how this is, you know, who has the authority to say, hey, this is the DNA of X, Y, Z fish? And my second question is, could you, in theory, or maybe that already exists, but apply the same mechanism to collect a uh, sample of soil or earth and determine the type of worms or insects that live in that sample? Uh, those are both very good uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, databases and the reference database is a big issue, and we're always trying to make sure it's, uh, we think what we're working with is correct. Uh, we use data that many researchers have deposited in GenBank, which is a public repository open to anyone of uh, genetic information from all sources. Uh, the more information about the specimen and where it came from that's in associated with the DNA record, the better we feel about it. But uh, there are mistakes in it. And uh, so, but that's a that's a solvable problem. Uh, the uh, the second question you can yeah there's DNA you would learn yes you can do DNA of soil there are a lot of people uh, doing that uh, you're going to get the actual organisms that are in there just as you get the uh, there's a lot of uh, microbes and fungi in the soil but you can also uh, get the animals uh, that uh, uh, that live there. And uh, Craig Venter did a project sequencing the air. They put air filters up and ran them for a month indoors, outdoors near a pier. And uh, uh, you can get, uh, you can find out, uh, and you get insects and little bits of insects uh, uh, through doing that. Uh, if you go to the seashore and it smells like the seashore, there's DNA in the air. It's not a lot, but yes, you could do that. One of the interesting side effects on our dog citizen science project is that we get people to do saliva swabs and then we sequence the DNA. And what people don't really realize is that we're getting a really nice data set about the dog's oral microbiome because 
the bacteria has DNA as well. So we sequence all the DNA. We only tell them about the dog part right now. We're trying to figure out how to put together a little visual display of what the oral microbiome looks like because it's in there. It's kind of interesting how easy it is to just get data. Interpreting it, though, is, is a whole different question. So. Any more questions? They're already it's, doing it. It's here. Um, it's, it's available. You probably yeah. run into this. Yeah, it it is, it is available. Um, we have, not I wouldn't say many, but several clients that have cloned their pets and who come to us for trying getting the appropriate samples in order to do so and going through the process of sending it to. There's like one or two places that that do it, and people do go down that road and clone their pets successfully after their pet is deceased. But it, it exists. It's very expensive. Yeah, there's, yes. there's also a number of, um, it's an interesting ethical question because there's actually um, a high failure rate in cloning. And there's also a question of what the cost is to the animals that they're using to actually produce the puppies. Yeah. And so I think if you're, it's an interesting question if you're a dog lover and you decide to go down the road of cloning, um, whether you should possibly look more closely at the actual process of producing the dog and not just the end product. Agreed. Here, sorry. You can use this. I did the 23 in May, and I also belong to Ancestry.com. And I didn't know my sister and my brothers until I was in my late 40s mm -hmm. on my father's side. And I thought, and when I did the 23 in May, I was shocked that I was not Irish and English. There was some Irish. However, I was German and Dutch. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. You know, I think it's great we're starting to study humans. Mm -hmm. We've studied everything but humans. And I think if we understand where we came from and how we got here, it may help us to understand that we're not alone in that, in that struggle. And the idea that I met my family so late in life, I, I wonder how many of us have relatives out there that we don't know. And wouldn't it be nice to know these people? So I, I'm pro. Um, I, a lot of the things they said about my health, I question. You know, whether I like sweet food or salty food, things like that, does it really matter? But it's nice to know where we come from. And, and you're um, actually very much in the majority of people who feel that way. So I think there was a really interesting study that surveyed close to 1,000, um, 100 people last year who had um, done direct-to-consumer testing, and 70% of them said they were very much in favor of doing ancestry testing. Less than 17% said that they were in favor of doing the health aspect of it. So. Well, there are actually um, federal policies in place to protect against health insurance, but I think with life insurance, it's a little different depending on whether or not you have a condition, and specifically for genetic conditions, it can affect individuals like children who have genetic disorders, and so there are health problems that they may incur from a very young age, and that's where the question of life policy comes into place. So I think families, some families feel differently about it. Okay. Um, it looks like we're out of time, but thank you guys so much for coming. It was a really interesting discussion. I definitely learned a lot. Um, and I'm sure if anyone has any questions, you can come up to the table and ask them now that we're, we're out of time. But thank you guys so much for coming and, and joining us tonight.